Hi, good morning. Welcome on the first session of today again. It's actually a very special session. Um, the reason for this is that the original speaker he bailed out three weeks ago. And Mostafa and I got to know each other actually last week, before we didn't know each other. And last Wednesday we got the message, hey guys, can you do this class? So I think we broke the record in building a class and we did it in two hours. So it's possible to reduce your prep time for AU if you want to be a speaker. So no need to, to do months of work in it. So actually we are still working. So Jacob is bringing us some extra materials. So you will see some weird things happening on stage here. And we decided to do some stuff live. So that's an extra stress we have today for it, but it will be fun. So no need to run away like, oh no, these guys did it in two hours, it will be crap. No, not at all. We are going to do the same class as actually the original class was about. Uh, so using generative design in construction. And the idea of the class is to go through several stages actually in generative design processes. So show you how traditional design works, how parametric design works, and actually how you can move on yourself into generative design. I will explain that a little bit more into detail. First, let's introduce uh, ourselves to you guys. So, is this working? Oh, yeah, it does. Right, good. So, my name is Dieter Vermeulen. I'm working as a technical specialist at Autodesk in Northern Europe. I'm based in Belgium and covering everything around computational design and engineering in that area. Um, it's not only my job, this generative design thing in AEC, but it's, it's also a passion for me. Um, it's, it's like a hobby, let's say. So if you can do this as a job, that's really great. Um, in the past, I've used to work as a structural engineer, and actually this experience helps to approach uh, generative design methods because you can use analytical approaches uh, to see these kinds of problems and to evaluate your problems. You can find me on, these kind, on all the social media links you see here on the presentation, so feel free to reach out afterwards uh, if you have any questions or whatever, so don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out. And it's up to you. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mustafa El Ayoubi. I am a design technology specialist. So I, like my main focus in my job is to always try and find the best practices around design technology. If the tools exist, try and build around them. If they don't, try and create them. So this is really something that I have a lot of fun doing. Uh, I'm an architect and civil engineer, uh, and like, it's sort of a passion of mine to really link those two together through design technology. All right, back to you, Dieter. Okay, so before we start digging in into depth in uh, some of the cases we want to sh uh, show you, I want to give you some insight on how we look at this uh, from our point of view on, on generative design. Now, designs today, what is actually, what does that mean? Well, nothing, not that much has changed through the, de the several decades between, let's say, 50 years ago and, and now in the way how we deliver designs, except for that at that time, 60s, we, we went in a nice shirt and tie to our jobs and now, sometimes people go in shorts and flip-flops to their, to their office. But the expertise, that's still the same. The expertise is in our heads. It's humans that decide how a design will look like. Now, imagine we have lasers on, the, on these things. So if there are like phones, then we can aim with the laser. Um, what about if you combine the engineering expertise or designer's expertise with a computer, with powers, or the power of a computer. Now, in a traditional design process is a bit like playing a game of, of battleship. Uh, you blindly guess on a spot uh, if you're doing any kind of simulation or analysis, and you can wait for a hit or a miss answer to come back. Now, by the time you get a hit, you're willing to settle for the acceptable solution. Uh, instead of leveraging a larger uh, design space and getting more design options. Now within generative design, we take or we build up constraints, goals, concepts. That's the human coming in. That's a person defining that. 
And a computer is used to generate, to evolve designs, to leverage that possibility, that possible hit, to make it easier to hit a good solution. And it's using algorithms for that. That's actually the only part where humans can be replaced by a computer. The next part is, again, a human. Because you get results from it, and these results need to be evaluated, and these results need to be explored, and then finally be integrated into the final design. So generative design is not only a tool. It's not just a software or something like that. It's actually a methodology. It's a process. It's a mindset. You cannot say, OK, let's buy a box of generative design. No, that doesn't exist. There are tools for that to apply generative design, to apply the methodology. So and that's what we would like to convince you about at the end of this presentation, that if you want to use generative design in any kind of your processes, it's about changing your mindset, and it's about changing your ideas, changing the, the way how you look at a specific design. Now, throughout the decades, the technology uh, experienced a growth. Um, in the, let's say, the 60s, we were talking about the era of documentation with sketching on paper. And it gradually evolved uh, with the introduction of CAT with computer-aided drafting. But the era of documentation, it means that we use software to document the ID which is inside of our head. So you immediately know what you want to do, and you draw it on paper, and the paper is your documentation to explain how it should be constructed on site. Now, in the era of optimization, with the introduction of BIM, we approach buildings more like systems. Systems that um, connect data with each other and that associate geometry to that data. In the era of connection, which is the era where, where, we in, where we are in right now, we are in the middle of that, that's actually about connecting data and the interconnection of data with models and people. So people connecting with each other, working together on the same model, or using specific techniques to generate uh, models or to use data to make your models in a better way. And that's where generative design comes in. So if we look to some examples in the architectural uh, industry, for instance, uh, let's use this. Oh, something's wrong with the videos, apparently. Well, OK, so imagine. See, this is what happens if you only have two hours. <laughs> Come on. Let's do this again. One more. No, it doesn't want to. Well, um, that's a bit harsh. Ah, OK, here we go. Well, actually, it was a video that was playing. You can see the video afterwards. We will upload this presentation onto a separate link, uh, which will be shared with you, or it's shared already in the handout. Now, the idea about this is that um, stadium design, for instance, is something we could see as, an, as a challenge to solve with generative design. Because we have like two opposite goals. We want to have the stadium with the most amount of people that can uh, host, be hosted in that stadium. But at the same time, you also want to improve the quality of the stadium. And you want to give everyone the possibility to have a good spot and to have a good view uh, on, the, on the playground. Um, another example is, for instance, parking layout. What about making a design where parking spots uh, are generated or that are, are placed in a specific layout which is ideal for other people to come in and to have like a fluent traffic onto that parking spot. Did it work this one already? Yeah? Okay, let's go to this slide over here then. Uh, and then the next one is actually a, um, yeah, uh, an example I'm sorry for this. It's a bit tricky to uh, explain. Yeah, it doesn't work. Anyway, well, let's switch from one presentation to another. That's how it goes, right? So in this, um, in this presentation, like I said, I want to go through the uh, design technology progression. And design technology progression is like where we go from one stage to another, from traditional design to parametric design to generative design. And at some point, you will be able to identify yourself in these stages. You will be like, ah, okay, this is where I am right now. 
as a person, as a team, as a company. Keep that point into mind and then you will understand how you can proceed, how you can go uh, into other stages of your design and improve the way how you work. So first, we start with traditional design. In traditional design, there is sketching. I hope no, no one of you is saying like, oh, okay, this is the stage where I am right now because that would mean you're still using pen and paper to make your designs, which is good by the way. It's still my favorite way of designing things to use a pen and paper and to do a little sketch and then draw it onto a computer. It's, that's always great to do, but we can improve it, of course. So that's where CAT came in because if you wanted to make a change, you had to do it very quickly and with CAT, that's possible. You can make changes easily. But let's go a stage further. Let's skip traditional design and let's immediately dive into parametric design. Now, parametric design is where we have a human combined with a computer, or you give that computer to someone who's working on it, that's maybe a better phrase, and you get a design. But your design is limited. It's limited because you're documenting that ID. You're using parametric methods, but it's still documenting an ID. You will understand way more at the end why I always emphasize documenting an ID. Now, one stage within parametric design is parametric modeling. And parametric modeling is where we use relationships between parameters, for instance, and if we change the root of that relationship, then it's actually the geometry that gets influenced by it. You change the geometry by changing parameters. That's actually what parametric modeling is about. Um, there is also design automation. Design automation is where we, use, where we take several elements, we process them into some kind of automation routine in an automation process or an automation script, and you get a result where everything is placed in that automatic way. That's what design automation does. Another example of design automation could, for instance, be generate all the drawing views for that building. That's also a part of design automation. Now, within the technology, there is Revit, for instance, which is already doing quite well on design automations. There are lots of tools in there that make it possible to make your designs very quickly in an automatic way. But yeah, the more power you want to get from it, the more difficult it gets within the software itself. And you can extend the capabilities using the Revit API. You can use programming techniques to, to build better tools in there or even more complex tools in there. Now, the downside of it is that you need to be a programmer. So that's very hard. So that's where Dynamo comes in. And Dynamo changes that ecosystem in some, um, in some part of the way because it's easier to, have, to, to, to use Dynamo for it to have more expressive tools. Let's look at this example, for instance. Even if you don't know what Dynamo is about, the right-hand side will show you what it does, and I'm pretty sure that you understand what it does. In case not, let me explain it to you. It selects a model element, it gets the volume of that element, and it returns 2.6. That's what it's actually doing. So that's easy, right? On the left-hand side, that's what you need to do if you want to program it in the Revit API. I will not try to explain because I don't understand it. So, but it's not, it's not bad to use programming language. It's actually way more versatile than using Dynamo then. And you have more control on it because you can really go into the details. While in Dynamo, you get a library of nodes that help you to build that connection, for instance, to build your workflow in there. So both have their pros and cons, okay? Now, within design automation, uh, this is one of our customers in, the Denmark, in Denmark, AB Clausen, and uh, they saw the advantage of using uh, Dynamo and Dynamo Player to automate all kinds of things in their designs. In this case, it's about the structural design, and they want to have coordinated openings in all of these walls depending on the architectural link, which is inside of the Revit model. Now, if you have to do this for these, I don't know, two, 300 windows, it takes you a lot of time if you have to do this manually and make all these section views and then coordinate the windows on it. So they use a script to read out all the values of the windows in the architectural model 
and then send them uh, in an automatic way into the structural model and create the openings like in 30 seconds. It took them a week to build up that script maybe, but now they use it on every project, which is like 30 seconds for placing all the window openings inside of that structural model. Another example is Dynamaps, and that's where Mostafa will explain us more about. Thank you. Yes, so Dynamaps. Uh, Dynamaps is another example of design automation using computational tools such as Dynamo. And Dynamaps is actually a specific development that was done on top of Dynamo. It's a, it's a package and an extension of that software. So what it does is it lets you bring in this type of data real fast. It's like a one-stop shop for all this type of information uh, inside Dynamo and then push it into Revit. And this little workflow that I will introduce is going to be part of the story that Detail is, uh, is uh, telling you. It is one step that might take us towards, that might lead us towards a better generative design process because it's bringing in some valuable data. All right, so just a little bit of information about Dynamaps is what it does is it connects four things with Dynamo. It connects Revit, Bing, uh, Bing Maps, to be more precise, as a uh, uh, map browser. You'll see that in action. I'll, I'll do a live demo of that. OpenStreetMaps, because it has a comprehensive uh, database, I mean, almost comprehensive database that is worldwide. And it's pretty detailed. It's really impressive, the amount of detail you get in there. Uh, that will be for uh, building geometry information and roads information and also tree information. So far, that's all Dynamaps uh, queries from that database. And also NASA's SRTM database for topography. Uh, this database is really awesome because it covers almost the whole globe with a very interesting um, level of detail. All right, so that's for the uh, general idea. Now, the workflow that I will demonstrate in about a minute goes like this. And it's pretty straightforward. First step is navigating to the site through this little user interface. Second step is pushing the data into Dynamo. Third step is processing the geometry. And then the last step will be to push it to Revit and then use it in our generative design process. All right, so time for a live demo. Uh, Ooh. All right, so as you can see right here, we're in an empty Revit model and we should have a session of Dynamo opens here. Okay, so the first step as indicated is to, as indicated earlier, is to come here and open Dynamaps and then access any destination, I mean, any place you're interested in, either by typing the address and uh, pressing the Take Me There button, or by browsing this map just like you would in Google Maps. It's pretty, like, people are used to this type of interface nowadays. So if we type the Venetian uh, Las Vegas USA, this should find us. All right, the pools, everything's here, cool. So just for uh, the sake of having a little fun, let's try and bring this geometry, this, this data into Dynamo. Um, so that will be footprint. <coughs> then we push it. I didn't go crazy on the zone that I query in because I don't really trust the internet connection here. <laughs> but See, that was pretty fast though. So if we try and query whoop, the contours of those parcels, just to better understand. So yeah, here's the Venetian Tower. This is the Palazzo. This is the Sands Expo place. So this is pretty much how it works. Now for the example that we will um, keep using during this presentation, I will go somewhere else, not in Vegas, because the roads data is a little messy, really, and there's not a lot of free land <laughs> in Vegas, not too much around here. So let's go to the Autodesk headquarters in Boston, uh, Boston, USA. That should be enough, I think. 
All right. Does anyone work here? No? Oh, Jacob, okay, cool. <laughs> well, if you're homesick. All right. And we noticed that there was a little parcel here uh, that was free, not too far from the Autodesk's um, headquarters in, in, in Boston. And all I have to do now that I have uh, browsed to this destination is, again, uh, push it to Dynamo. There's less stuff going on there, but still, this is it. So those are the Autodesk buildings, and this here is the parcel. Now let's get a little more information. I can close this because the information is now streamed, and I can query some more. So I can go and get the topography points. We can see that it's not too far above sea level, which is correct. And get this topography as a surface. Can query roads. You have all types of roads. This is all um, open street maps nomenclature. If we select them all, here they are. So there's a lot of data out there. Okay, now for the next part, which is pushing this to Revit. There are a set of, there is a set of nodes for that. Let's first create the topography. Uh, by points, that's the one. Okay, so there it is. Now next step is the buildings. We have surface and elevation data coming out from OpenStreetMaps. Just need to categorize the geometry that we'll be creating. Okay, give it the surface and run this. Here we are. We have a site now. Now we can do a little more than this. We can bring in the roads. Uh, first, I need to process this geometry, so back to the previous stage actually. Hopefully it won't take so long. And last step is to push that into Revit. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's just a little warning. But what we got here is our road system. I just changed the material so we can better visualize it. There we go. So this is the part of a design where automation can come in really handy because you won't spend much time downloading stuff and translating it and converting it from a, like a version to another one or a uh, format to another one. This is all gathered through powerful automation tools such as Dynamo and then pushed into Revit. And you can keep going with your generative design process starting off this space. All right. Let me switch. Okay, thank you. We're not done yet. <laughs> okay. Does it show? All right. Thanks, was cool, right? Let's continue. How can we process further? Well, the next stage is computational modeling. It's, we are still within parametric design for the record. So we had traditional design with sketching and CAT. We had parametric design with parametric modeling, design automation, and now we're at the stage of computational modeling. I think a few people around you will already be like, I'm at that stage, right? Let's proceed and see what's happening next. Well, the process within a computational modeling ID is where you have data and input and we use that data to generate something, to analyze that something, that geometry or that ID, and then to explore it. 
So exploration means looking at the results of your analysis. Now, an analysis doesn't necessarily have to be a structural analysis or something like that. It also could be like detection of um, elements towards each other, like a geometrical detection is something clashing that's already in an analysis. Or for instance, um, finding the surface or the area of a specific surface, that's already an analysis. And the exploration phase is where we are going to look at the results and use those results to make a decision. And once you made your decision, you can integrate it into your final design model. Now, the example I'm going to use for that is um, the crane position uh, optimization, let's call it. It's a case that I presented already three years ago, I think, here at AU. But at that time, we didn't have tools like, or not that complex tools like refinery, or advanced tools, I'm sorry, like refinery. Um, we could only use Dynamo and, and a complex package called uh, Optimo to find that optimal position of that crane. Maybe some of you were in that class, I don't know. Well, anyway. Um, Let's have a look on how that process could work. Now, what I always say, if you get into a, a more complex um, problem that you want to solve with Dynamo, is a good idea is to use flowcharts. A flowchart to document your ID already a bit. I'm there again, documenting IDs. So use that flowchart to think about what are my inputs, how can I analyze them, and how will I explore them? How will I view the results? So in this case, for uh, a crane optimization routine, we are going to take inputs from a Revit model, which will be the building elements, a crane, and a truck. Now, the information of a crane will be its load capacity. So what is the capacity versus range of that crane? And then a truck will be, what is the position of that truck? Where will it deliver the precast elements on site? Now, that information will be extracted into the Dynamo model and then used to evaluate um, this whole thing and to see what are, for instance, the weights of the elements and let's compare them with the capacity range of uh, the crane. And as a result, we get colored elements. Red means like this element is not reachable at all. It doesn't matter how much it weighs, we can just not take it because it's too far away from the crane. Green means we, the element is left liftable in any case. It means that the truck delivers it in the right position, the crane is in the right position, so we can lift it from the truck and deliver it on the right position onto the construction site. And in between, there is yellow and orange. Now, the idea is, of course, in the optimization, to have a result where every element is colored in green, right? We, all, we want to have it all completely liftable. Now, in some cases, or in a lot of cases, I would say, on the construction sites, it's very obvious where to position the crane. I see you thinking that already. Like, like yeah, why, why would you use generative design to decide where to position the crane? It's obvious. Let's place it there. Now, in some cases, we over-design everything. We take, like, the most heavy crane that exists and then rent it, and it's like, yeah, it will be safe. But what about if we could use our own cranes and maybe set two cranes on the site, but they are our own, so we don't have any costs in renting a very heavy crane, for instance. So the workflow in here is that we take the existing building, which is a precast building. So um, if some of you are going to visit Boston, probably this building will pop up on the construction site that Mustafa just picked, and then we own that, we own that place. Now you're like, yeah, let's build it. So this is the example, the Revit advanced example model you find. Uh, and yeah, let's use the script on that. That's where, what I want to demo to you guys. And the idea is not just to take the elements, but of course to analyze the elements and look at their position in the building, look at their weight, compare it with the crane position, compare it with the crane capacity, and then analyze, evaluate, and send the results back to Revit. Now, it's, it's quite some script to do that. Um, I'm not going to place all these notes live like, for instance, Mostafa uh, just did right now, because otherwise we might sit here until the end of the day. But I will go through the process with you guys and explain you what is doing what exactly and, and how you can use it yourself into your daily work. Now, as I said, the computational design process is about generate, analyze, explore. Try to keep that in mind as well if you set up these kinds of scripts. Use the same colors, maybe. Then it identifies for yourself what part of the script is actually generate? What part of the script is analyze? 
and also especially if you share it with your colleagues, it's good for them to understand what is actually the whole process in this Dynamo script. Unfortunately, I see enough Dynamo scripts where everything is like one big chaos and you don't understand at all what it's actually doing. So that's where groups and colors are for within Dynamo. So this is the example of what is analyzed then. And now I want to go live in this thing instead. So that's the most exciting part. It's, it's been five years ago since I've done a live demo. So um, I normally use videos because, yeah, you can tweak them. Uh, OK, so this is the full script. As I said, using colors. Gray is data, green is generate, analyze, and these are the results, exploration, and then we have integrate into Revit. Now, this is the building and the construction site that uh, Mostafa just created with Dynamaps. So in the meantime, what we did be, uh, after that was actually integrating that building on that construction site, of course. And the idea is to find the best position of the crane onto that building path we have here. At the same time, we also created a um, path for the trucks. Yeah, I'm always having struggles with, in, in English with paths and paths. It's, it's a bit weird thing to express. Uh, anyway, so the truck is going to um, change its position along this line. So that's the two inputs we get from, uh, from Revit in here. At the same time, we also have the model elements that we should create. So the model elements are the ones that are uh, modeled, of course, in Revit. So these are the parts for the floors and walls, columns and beams. And I want to categorize them uh, according to um, yeah, their structural family category, category so that you have walls, floors, columns and beams, because and, and framing, I mean. And each one of them has a specific weight. So I'm not taking the weight from the Revit model because that weight in there is just like a volume. While beams and columns, they also have, especially in concrete, they also have a rebar inside of it. So the, the density, the weight of each of these elements might be different, right? So to do that is the, what is actually a good idea to do, uh, to use this, and that's a tip that I got from Jacob uh, two weeks ago, is using, building dic or using dictionaries. I'm sorry, I'm calling this a building dictionary. So a dictionary inside of uh, Dynamo helps to collect your geometry, but also data. And you can combine them together into one nice list and into a, a nice dictionary, which is structured. And it means that it's, it's caching, actually, your data. And it's not showing it into the graphical interface. So Concerning performance, this is really helpful because I don't want all these elements to be shown in my Dynamo model at, at the beginning of my script. I want them only to be shown once I got the results on it. So if you can avoid that, if you can avoid all these geometries into your user interface, dictionaries are very helpful for that. So let's see what's happening. Um, oh yeah, this could stay there, but yeah, it doesn't matter. So press. Let's start the first run. So in this first run, it will take all the elements from the Revit model and it will actually all already process it. So you will see that it will be colorized, but that doesn't matter. I first want to show you what is actually a dictionary looking like. And um, in this dictionary, as you can see, it's not just the solid geometry, it's also the Revit ID and the Revit category that will come in. So if you look at this, you get a Revit ID, you get a solid, and we get a category. This means that now everything is sorted in, in, in the right way in this dictionary, and it will help us to identify each element, to calculate its weight, and to understand which category it belongs to. And plus, we also get a Revit ID, meaning that afterwards, if we want to process this into, uh, the, into the Revit model, we can select it by its Revit ID, its unique ID. Okay. So that's actually the backbone of this whole analysis. Uh, and there are a few other uh, things that needs to be selected in there, of course, and that's the uh, context, the context for where, where do we want to place that crane and where do we want to drive the truck. So we need to select the surface, of course, for the crane. Let's do that. Select surface. 
and then take the top of the pot. And then this one, and that's the curves of, for the truck. So we did it a little bit quick and dirty with this uh, 3D element to uh, decide where the truck will drive. But it's just like a placeholder. It doesn't mean anything here because I want to have edges. And the edges in here will define the poly curve that will define how the truck will drive around the construction site. So let's run it again. Now you could you see that there is already data inside of that Dynamo model. While I didn't do any selection in Revit, so you might think like this is weird, this is a bit confusing. Now the reason because we have that data already in there are two specific nodes, especially when you will download the script that is. Uh, uh, in the handout, you will find the links for all of these scripts uh, so you can download it and use it yourself. You will see that specific node called data.remember. Data remember is something from the refinery package. And data remember is actually storing all the Revit information that is converted into Dynamo geometry. And it's storing that information so that refinery can process it. It means that refinery and that's for a later stage in the presentation when it will run on top of the scripts. It's actually taking six or is it six Dynamo interfaces? Yeah, six Dynamo sessions that will run simultaneously. And uh, they cannot connect with Revit. So they cannot read what is actually selected from Revit. What are the model categories coming in from Revit? And that data remember node does that thing. Um, so that's why it's in there, but it doesn't do anything into this workflow, OK? So it's, it's not needed. We can even delete them and reconnect it this way. That would work as well. Now, once we got the selection of our elements, the selection of our context, the crane range and load capacity, which could actually also be an Excel file. So I, I just did it for the, for the easiness of sharing the information with you afterwards. I just put it, the crane uh, table into uh, the capacity table in there. And then we also have some vehicles. And the vehicles are the crane and the truck itself, just an SAT file, just to visualize it into the Dynamo context. That's the only reason why we have that SAT file connection in here. If you don't want to visualize it, if you just want to use a cube or a cylinder within Revit or within Dynamo, that's fine too. But I like to have more visual compelling things in this. OK, so everything which is gray is input. Oh, and the most important inputs, the position of the crane and the position of the truck. Now, once all of this has been set up, we need to generate the geometry, need to generate the data. And the initialization part in here is visualizing everything from that, uh, from that dictionary, so all of the elements. And it's also calculating the distances from each element towards the truck and towards the crane. And this will be stored again into a dictionary. It's actually reusing the building dictionary, but now it's a building dictionary including properties. So if we compare the dictionary to the one we had before, we don't only have solids, Revit ID, and the category. We also get, for instance, what is its calculation point of that element, and also what is the weight of that element. So calculation point is, in this case, the centroid. The centroid of the element projected on an xy plane. That's the coordinates we get in here. So the analysis, the analysis at least, from this, uh, from this dictionary is then where we take the crane positions, compare them with the positions of each element, uh, also look if the crane positions are actually on the building path. So we want to make sure that the position is not like somewhere outside of the construction site. So that's an extra check. Check if the point generated for the crane is exactly on the surface that I just selected. And then some truck positions. And the whole analysis is actually done within this custom node. It's a lift analysis uh, node. And within that node, if you, go, if you would go into it, you will see that it's actually exactly the same process as the flowchart that I just showed you. It takes the elements, it takes its calculation points, it takes the calculation point of the crane, and then it just do like a simple math. What is the distance between the crane point and the element point? And then you get like, for instance, 60 meter. Okay, 60 meter, that's unreachable because my crane only has a maximum reach of 45 meter. Okay, next element. Distance, ah, distance to the crane is, for instance, 
30 meter. Okay, 30 meter, that means if I look at my capacity table, the crane has a capacity of, for instance, eight tons for a, for a range of 32 meters. What is the element weight? Well, the element, its weight is six ton. Okay, it can be lifted. What is the position towards the truck? Oh, that's 50 meter. Okay, then we have an issue because the crane range is only 45 meter. We can lift the element, so we can deliver it onto the, onto the construction site, but the truck is too far away. So that's another status we can give to the element. And then finally, there is the third uh, status, is that the element is within range of the truck, is within the range of the crane, but it's too heavy. So that means that we, are, we need another crane or we need to reposition the crane so that it can lift that element. So this way you have four specific states for each of the elements. And this means that the building dictionary that's getting uh, inputted in here is now updated again. It's updated in this way, and I need to track time here. It's updated in this way that we have unreachable elements with their Revit ID, their weight, the distance to the crane, as you can see here, and then the lift status index, which is just a number. A number that will be used in Revit to colorize the results. So you can visualize the results, of course, as well in Dynamo, which I always advise to do is take your geometry and then use the uh, geometry color by geometry color note uh, to showcase within the Dynamo script how the results are actually working. So the last step in there is then to take the results and send them to Revit. So there is also like this little output which will be used later on in the refinery workflow is where we say like this is the output of values for the lift status. Uh, so we have that amount, of that amount of percentage for liftable elements, uh, elements with a truck issue, non-liftable and unreachable elements. So the goal will be to have 100% liftable and 0% for all the other status. So send to Revit means like that I want to document the solution here into the Revit model. So let's say run. And there we go. The cranes including the position of the truck. But this is a computational modeling workflow, meaning that if I want to change the position of these cranes and make a new analysis because the colors are not okay, you don't have 100% green elements. And within a computational modeling workflow, you still have to change those sliders, the upfront sliders, defining the position of the cranes and defining the position of the trucks. So the script is not telling us that this is an ideal solution, it's just calculating the solution that I want to exp that I want to analyze right so in a generative design process we are going to take all of these parameters and uh, run them in a random way or run them in a genetic algorithm way so to optimize the positions okay now within the Revit model if you go into for instance this view the 3d analysis view we have the same colors in there for the model, so we see now we can see that if we would use this configuration for the site layout, then the middle part of the building will be okay, but then we have lots of these yellow elements, meaning that there is a truck issue. It's meaning that we should consider other delivery points for that truck. So the cranes are positioned very well, and that's the obvious part. Okay, we know how, where to place a crane, but sometimes we have an issue where the truck is coming, right? So that's analyzed in here as well. Uh, let's go back to the uh, presentation and how much time do we have? Oh, not that much anymore. Now, um, Jacob just ran in this morning here into uh, when the class already started to uh, uh, show something that we discussed actually yesterday night. Like, uh, oh, hey, I have an ID. What about scaffolding? Could we do something with scaffolding uh, into that class? So he managed to create that script yesterday night and, and made a video on, the, on this whole ID that we had on that building. So that's so exciting if you have to prepare classes at the last minute, right? So instead of having beers like you guys could have, yeah, we were working, right? <laughs> now, and this, uh, actually, maybe I should give the word to you so you can tell what this is actually doing. So oh, sure. you, you would love to do that?
Can you guys hear me okay? Whoa, that's loud. All right. Um, so basically what this graph does is it's going to analyze the basic overall mass and find out where the lowest points are uh, to all the way around the model. Uh, once we have that, so you can see here I'm actually selecting the link, I've selected the pieces, nothing up my sleeve. Uh, once we have those uh, points, uh, sorry, those curves that sort of define the piece, uh, oh, did we restart it? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so what, what this is doing here is it's grabbing the lowest most point, kind of the, the first floor level where your scaffolding would want to sort of take off. Um, from there, it's finding those perimeter curves, offsetting those curves uh, by whatever distance you want your scaffolding off the face of the facade, uh, and then allowing, uh, sort of generating these curves that sort of, uh, sorry, this path that follows the piece so that we can then to begin to sort of lay out whatever scaffolding system we might want in a way that's going to enable uh, the best sort of reach, the least amount of parts, and we can start to get into optimization based on tweaking those values. Sadly, because of the short time constraints, I didn't get to play around with refinery on this one. Um, but uh, from here, what we do, uh, can we fast, uh, we can't really fast forward the video for a bit. Uh, so in any case, once we have those pieces uh, selected, it's going to lay out all our H frames for our scaffolding, uh, all our crossbars and all our deck boards across the entire uh, parts and pieces. So what you can see there is my, I was dancing the mouse around a bit while I waited for this piece to actually uh, realize that, oh, I forgot to select my model element. It's waiting for me to do that. Uh, once I've done that, I click run. Uh, it takes a little bit to run this piece through, but in the end, it's going to wind up placing, I think it was 8,324 uh, family instances at the right location, uh, at the right size. So you can see there now all the scaffolding has been placed uh, on the model. Um, all of those pieces are individual Revit families that we can now count, we can now schedule, we can now put a price to, we can now have an understanding of what the actual cost and process for building this piece is without having to take the time to manually lay out all of those individual elements. We can get way more specific than we could with, let's say, a cost per square foot number uh, or something like that. So we can really sort of expand this out. Um, so from here, the next sort of piece, if, we, if I did have a little bit more time to put this into refinery, would be to build a few different sets of scaffolding families so that I would then be able to take this same concept and say, okay, of all the options that I have available in my warehouse, based on the number of pieces that I have available to me at this given moment in time, what's the right one for this particular project? The crane's already up, it's got the co concrete on site, everything's laid out, and now it's time to start to work on that facade, and that's sort of that next step. So you can see this idea of generating and optimizing really continues beyond that initial single problem. It can be applied to pretty much any problem within the construction uh, industry. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. So, next stage, traditional design, parametric design. Now let's go into generative design. And I'm a bit afraid that we are going to uh, get a little bit over time. So we were actually afraid that we would not have enough content for 60 minutes, but we have content for like more than 60 <laughs> minutes apparently. So that's great. Now, so bear with us because this is the most exciting part now. It's generative design. So, what's the difference? In computational modeling or computational design, I was talking about that one person which you give a computer and you get a design which is somehow limited, right? Because it was about documenting an ID. Now, in this part, it's where we have that person again with computing power, doesn't matter which kind of computing power, desktop, cloud, or whatever, but in the middle, you have those algorithms. And algorithms are capable of helping us to solve these most complex problems because algorithms solve what we cannot comprehend with our own brain. And as a result of that, you get hundreds, thousands, or even millions of design options in the same time as you would need to only describe one in a traditional or a parametric design method. Now, within generative design, we are using genetic algorithms. And genetic algorithms are mimicking the natural uh, the nature's evolutionary theory. It's like the theory of Darwin, which is mathematized within, the, uh, within our software, within these algorithms. It's like us evolving as humans, right? Now, the process in there is a bit longer than what we had in a computational modeling process. It's still about the data, and we generate something from that data, which we will analyze. But then an additional step is ranking. Ranking and evolving. 
I will explain you a bit more into detail in the next slides. Now, the evolving part, that's actually where generative design, where the genetic alg algorithms come in. Evolving will change these parameter inputs, for instance, the sliders of, those, of the crane positions, in such a way that it will evolve, that it will convert into a specific solution, which is trying to achieve the goals that we have set. What is the goal of my script? Well, I want to have 100% of liftable elements. That's the goal we want to achieve here. Now at the end, when all of this, this whole process has been done by the computer, it's again a human that's coming in to explore, to, to review the results and to select the champion of the results and integrate it into the design model. So this is how it goes. In Generate, we are generating a set of elements that come from the input parameters. For instance, these kinds of windows. In Analyze, we are going to review these elements and, and look at the elements from a specific point of view. For instance, does this window give us a good overview on, 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 on the site exteriorly? Uh, or another analysis could be, what is the amount of daylight we can get in into the building with these windows, right? So that's analyzing. Ranking is where you select the right element. You say, like, oh, okay, this type of window if I evaluate that type of window, I get the best view outside and I get the best daylight internally. Okay, that's what ranking is doing. And evolving is where the ranking system is used to find better results. So it's evolving the parameters in such a way that the analysis results are converging into that optimal one. Now, finally, when we have all of our solutions, because this is what a generative design process does, it might give you multiple solutions. It's not only one solution you get from it, there are multiple possibilities. And then from that on, you can choose which one you like the best, depending on its aesthetics and also from the results you get from it. So that's the exploration phase. And then you choose the one and integrate it into your building, into your design. So, uh, one of the products uh, that, we, uh, that we talked about uh, last year already at AU was Project Refinery. And Project Refinery is our answer to generative design in the AEC industry. Now, it's a beta product. It does, it does mean it's, it's not a commercial product. It's not like commercially available, but it's freely available for you as a user. You can go to it through this link and download it yourself, play with it, and preferably also give us feedback on what you think about the product. So um, Refinery itself as a software, as a tool, is a very simple thing. You can learn it in like one minute. So um, I'm pretty sure that if someone comes up with a course of Refinery just to learn the interface, it's like a one minute course. What is the most difficult part? That's making your scripts in that way that they are useful to be used by Refinery. So it's about the mindset, it's about the methodology that you use to analyze your designs. That's the most difficult part. That's what you have to learn to use it in Refinery. Now Refinery itself as a tool is an add-in on top of, uh, of Dynamo and it's running your Dynamo script like simultaneously. I just explained it, it's like six sep uh, separate versions of the Dynamo sandbox that are running into the memory of your computer and that's actually Refinery doing that. And it's collecting the results from it and it's um, yeah, organizing these results in these nice diagrams we have, like a 4D scattered plot diagram, or we also have a table where you can see the results or, is, or there is that parallel uh, results uh, system that you get from it. This is helpful to filter your results and to find your ideal design in there. So um, there are a few types of studies in there. There is the randomization where you just pick randomly a, a, a set of parameter values and you combine them into a specific solution which is then organized in that design space. Or there is a cross product which is a more structured way within a grid to, uh, to showcase all the right solutions for it. And then finally there is also the optimize one. And optimize is using that genetic algorithms. It starts first with a random set of parameter values it looks at the results from it, and then it uses the evalu its internal evaluation with crossover and mutation uh, algorithms to find a second generation uh, of parameter values, and then it's converging until it's finding the, the optimal solution. Uh, one of the uh, 
uh, examples uh, we've used to have in the past already is a case with uh, a company in the Netherlands called Van Wenen. That's actually where we finally got born. Uh, that company asked us to ask Autodesk Research to support them on a specific ID they had uh, to optimize the way how they design buildings. They have like a specific way of making these houses and they use modular construction techniques to build these houses uh, into their factory. And they didn't only want to optimize the way how they construct, they also wanted to optimize the way how they design these buildings. And that's where generative design came in very handy. So they get like the plot boundary of the site and they use that to create a grid on it. And with that grid, they create roads, parcels, and uh, from that they can also build the right position of each of the houses. Now it's not just building houses they want to do, they want to find out what is actually uh, the revenue from this house, what is the profit we can get for it from this type of layout for each of the houses, but also uh, find uh, results for, for instance, um, ecological impacts, for instance, what is the solar gain we can get from this kind of configuration? What is maybe the variety even onto that, uh, onto that developed area? Because we don't just want to pull all these houses on top of, of a site. We want to make it comfortable for the inhabitants to live there. So with green zones, with playgrounds, and so on and so on. So, and this came up, uh, as, a, as a result, it came up with like thousands of possible results you could get from it. And that's actually where the basis of refinery was born. So refinery became then a more generic product to do this on not only this project, but also on all of your projects. This is a screenshot from how, how it looks like in, in Dynamo, for instance. Again, with this colorization, it's a very handy way to show how your results look like. Now, what about the crane? Within the crane uh, position optimization, uh, this is not using the Boston site anymore because this video was already created a long time before. But it, in this case, it will take that same script that I just showed you, and it's taking it into the refinery interface and creating a study on it. In this case, it's using a study, uh, it's the optimization video in this case, yeah. So it's optimizing, or it, we want to optimize the input parameters. So we want to find a good solution for that U position for the crane, the V position of the crane, and then also the positions of the truck. So you indicate within the interface which parameters you want to optimize, and then you also indicate what is actually the goal of uh, my optimization, which is 100% of liftable elements, or maximize the liftable elements, the amount of liftable elements. That's actually my goal. So the genetic algorithms in here will do their work to change all the input parameters, which are actually a lot. There are six parameters that need to be changed. That's a lot. Um, and you get all these results then in that parallel system, for instance, which is handy to use a filter on because I don't want to see the solutions where, for instance, the, the percentage of liftable elements is less than 70. I only want to see the top part of it, and then you get like maybe four or five results. Now, what you could see in this case is that we didn't have an optimal solution for it yet. And that might be, the reason for that might be that there isn't an optimal solution. That's one thing. So it might mean that I need to change the way how the trucks come around the building. Maybe I need to add a new path to it. Or the cranes are not positioned well enough. Or I need to do more iterations. That's also a solution. So in this case, I did, I don't know, 40 or 20 iterations. Maybe I should have done 50 iterations, right? Or what you also could do is take the results from the uh, refinery study, open it up into Dynamo, and tweak it manually inside of Dynamo. That's also a possibility. Uh, so don't believe that solutions that are working on a generative, generative, Jesus, a generative design method, method, that they will give you always the optimal solution. No, they will help you to find that optimal solution, that ideal solution, but it might need some manual refinement. So that's what I showed at the beginning of the presentation in the process. It's the human with the computer, and then again, that human that helps to refine all of it, right? And you want to say something more about Dynamaps, I guess. Yes, well, it is. Uh, I mean, this 
picture is from Dynamaps, and it is a use case that could use Dynamaps, but in a more general way, uh, with gen generative design, I can't stress enough the fact that the data that you are going to input is really key. Say you have a goal, say you have a daylighting uh, analysis to run <laughs> on a building. Well, having the uh, site geometry of that, of that building you're trying to build is definitely a key element because this is going to cast some shadow on your, on your parcel. So obviously you will need to give it the site geometry information. Any goal you might have, you need to give it all the valuable data that it needs to test all the options against. So in machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, I have a friend who works in IT and he has a saying, I don't, think, I don't know if it's his or if it's a, an industry saying, but it's trash in, trash out. Basically, if you give it too many informations that are not relevant, it's just not gonna give you interesting results. Well, it's exactly the same mindset you should have with generative design. You have a goal, you need to figure out the information that are relevant to that study, to that whole process, and give it to the computer so we can compute. That's what it does best. All right. Okay. So bear with us like for maximum five, six minutes. I have a few more things to, to talk you through. And one last thing in generative design is another contractor in the Netherlands that is also using design and engineering or delivering design and engineering serv uh, services. And besides the fact that they are using generative design, it's also about, uh, the most exciting part is that they want to optimize the layout of a liquor store. And it's a very simple uh, objective they want to reach in here. Uh, they want to optimize the layout of that liquor store and make it possible to find solutions with the biggest revenue, but also with the best comfort for, those, uh, for the people that are walking in into that uh, shop, and also for the, 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 the people that are running the shop. So they want to have a good position of the counter and find that position uh, in such way that the, the, the person running the shop is ha having a full overview on the shop in internally so that, it, that he or she can see what is happening. Is someone stealing, for instance, uh, bottles or something like that? Um, it's still a proof of concept, and they are, uh, but what is nice about this case is that we talked about generative design December last year and they got a class at AU London this year already, in six months. And before that six months, they didn't know anything about generative design. So it's not that difficult to get into it yourself. It's about changing your mindset, and it's about understanding where you are into that design technology progression that I talked to you about. So we went through traditional design, parametric design, and generative design. And the biggest difference between those two is that within parametric design, we are recording decisions and associating geometry with it. So we are documenting our ID, while in generative design, we are talking about constraints and goals. So instead of talking about designing a chair, we say like, I want to design something to sit on. So generally, that could be a pillow, that could be a bench, that could be a couch. Yeah, we're finished. I'm sorry for running out of time. So um, you know what to do now? And please give us, thank you.